Hi, um, I'm Marion Carici. I'm the faculty advisor of Duke Disability Alliance. It's my privilege to welcome you to this event, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, behind me, you'll see our Disability Pride Week website. Um, this is our finale for a week of exciting events um, that were coordinated by Jay and other students of DDA. Um, so feel free to check this out anytime. It's at tinyurl.com slash disabilityart. Um, so we're very, very proud of all the work that went into this week. Um, and I'm very happy to welcome our first artist uh, to the stage, um, Carrie Sundahl. Um, and I mean, when we started planning this event, it was the students who decided which artists they wanted to invite. And I taught a disability and representation course last um, fall. And one of my students, who's the secretary of DDA, um, wrote his paper on disability and the performing arts. And I said, Simon, who would you like to invite to Duke? He was like, he got stars in his eyes. And he was like, Carrie Sundahl, maybe? And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so Carrie Sundahl is associate professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago in the Department of Disability and Human Development. She directs Chicago's Bodies of Work, an organization that supports the development of disability arts and culture through festivals, advocacy, and an artist residency program. Her research and creative activity focus on disability identity in live performance and film. Sundahl's publications include a co-edited anthology, Bodies in Commotion, Disability and Performance, which garnered the Association for Theater in Higher Education's Award for Outstanding Book in Theater Practice and Pedagogy. Sundahl frequently travels nationally and internationally to speak about her research and arts advocacy initiatives, most recently delivering a keynote address at the, two, the 2017 European Society for Disability Research at the University of Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, currently, Carrie is collaborating on a documentary called Code of the Freaks, a critique of disability representations in cinema, which will premiere in 2018. And she will be sharing an exclusive premiere of um, part of that film with us today. Carrie, I welcome you to the stage. Thank you. You guys are fancy here at Duke. Look at this wine glasses. UIC, we'd have like plastic bottles if you're lucky. Mm. All right, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. It's very cold in Chicago and it's nice and warm here, and there's flowers blooming, and it's just, I really am happy to be invited. And I'd like to thank Marion and the Disability Student Group and everyone for inviting me today. And I'm excited to share some of this work with you. Um, so uh, my work is, I can divide it into three areas. So I do work as an academic, so I do research on disability art and culture. I do a lot of arts advocacy in trying to build capacity for artists with disabilities. Um, throughout the United States and sometimes I do international work and some of that includes disability policy efforts in the arts and then also um, I'm an artist so I try to have those three areas advancing and informing one, e one another as um, my work progresses so the work I will be sharing with you today this excerpt from the film is combines all those efforts there's a, sort of an academic critique in the film there's advocacy efforts for people with disabilities in film, and then also it's a work of art in and of itself. So that'll give you a good sense of the, the project overall. So as Marion mentioned, I'm the director of a program called Bodies of Work. And what we do is uh, we advocate and we support the development of disability art and culture. It's a consortium of 50 individual artists and arts organizations. I don't know if that's on a timer or something, um, throughout the city of Chicago. And this is our mission. We're a network of artists and organizations, a catalyst for disability art and culture that illuminate the disability experience in new and unexpected ways. So we are, are interested in thinking about how people with disabilities communicate their experience of the world, not only the um, politics of disability, but also the way that our unique bodies, minds, and senses inform our aesthetics. And we're also really interested in how access can become part of an aesthetic. And we're doing some experimental work now in that area. And I'm trying to share some of that with you as well. 
And I was asked today to kind of give an overview of what we mean when we say disability art and disability culture. So I wanted to give you a definition that has come out of the work that we're doing in Chicago. And just so you know that this work is, uh, this definition is, um, it's taken over, it's got a life of its own. Uh, I don't know why the timer's doing that. Um, but this is something that we came up with as a group of artists in Chicago that we felt described the movement, but it's also one that's not, um, it, it's open for debate, and there are parts of it that I think are, are a little bit contentious. So I offer it to you and offer it for you to engage with it and how it manifests in your experience. But we think that it reverse, refers to the creative work by people with disabilities that reflect a disability experience either in content or form. So what this means is that you can, disability art doesn't always have to be quote unquote about disability. We also consider disability art work that is informed by unique bodies, minds, and senses. So for instance, a, a painter who uses a, a paintbrush in her mouth is going to have a different set of brush strokes than someone who uses their hand. And we're interested in artists who want to explore that difference, who find that difference as something generative, something to talk about, something to explore. So, or you can think about dance, which we're gonna get to see a um, painter and a dancer, so this is a good example. But how, um, for instance, if you have a dancer who uses a wheelchair and that dancer wants to participate in ballet, that art form is necessarily going to change by the presence of the artist with a disability. So it becomes something different, even if the work isn't about disability. So we're interested in those two angles. And then it can include non-disabled allies who work explores the disability experience. So we're interested in work by people who, we think of disability not necessarily as an individual experience, but as a set of relationships. Disability isn't experienced in isolation, it's experienced in communication, in, in relationship with other people. So we are interested in the work of non-disabled people that are wanting to explore that relationship and explore their relationship to disability, as long as it's doing something that illuminates the experience in a new and unexpected way. So as long as it's not patronizing, it's not medicalized, it's not sentimental. If they're saying something that's you know, by and with us, then we include that work. This, that's one of the controversial elements, just so you know. Um, and also you can find it in all artistic media. So you could find it in the performing arts, literature, visual arts, comic books, film, design. Um, you can find artists with disabilities working in all these media. And if you might not know it's there, but you, know, you, can, you can find it pretty much everywhere. But not all artists will identify as being part of the disability art and culture movement. Um, and so that's something I think that different artists have to gauge for themselves. Um, sometimes people don't want to be pigeonholed as a disabled artist. And other times people find that that affiliation is really generative and allows them to explore experiences and have conversations and explore aesthetics that might not otherwise be considered um, appropriate to that art form. And then it's also shown in accessible spaces with accommodations in place, created for audiences with disabilities as well as for the mainstream. And this is one that's really hard to adhere to as a principle or as a guiding definition. Um, because as you know, there are a lot of uh, spaces that are not accessible. And this makes it really difficult for our artists who make a living as through their work. So for instance, we have a painter whose work I'm briefly gonna mention later, um, named Riva Lair. And a lot of her work is, uh, she, she creates portraits primarily of other disabled people. And she has a mobility impairment. And a lot of the subjects that she paints uh, need access to get into these spaces. So does she show her work if she gets a show if it's not accessible to the people whose lives she's portraying? And that can be a really difficult um, thing to navigate because given that there are a lot of spaces that are inaccessible, how do you get your work out there? It's kind of like a chicken and egg thing. And I think each artist tries to deal with that separately. And it's also difficult sometimes to figure out how to make your work accessible 
to people whose impairments are different from your own. So for instance, this semester, I'm working with a sound artist who's creating an installation, a sound installation, and he's blind. And he'd never thought about how to make his work accessible to deaf and hard of hearing audiences. So we're having this wonderful time experimenting with transducers and body packs and how to make sound something that's tactile as well as something to listen to. But that's part of a disability aesthetic of thinking about how um, in making something accessible you are creating a community experience and not something that's so individual. And then um, disability art is considered an integral aspect of both the disability civil rights movement and disability culture or the self-consciously created community of diverse disabled people in terms of impairment type, race, class, gender, and sexuality who nevertheless share certain experiences, values, and perspectives. So disability culture is another thing that people debate whether it exists or not. And we've just decided we're not debating it, we just say it is, because <laughs> we say it does. And that's what I mean that every act, self-conscious act of bringing it into being, brings it into being. And that it's something that you know we've learned a lot from the deaf community and deaf people do or do not identify as um, with artists with disabilities. It depends on their perspective on whether um, whether to be allies or whether to be part of the movement, and it changes depending on who you're engaging with. But the the values and experiences we share tend to be um, some of the things that I've listed here. And so across the media, there's certain themes that have helped shape disability culture. So if I'm looking at it as a whole, I can identify these elements. So one is that often there's an engagement with political issues um, that are relevant to people with disabilities. Not always, but sometimes. And sometimes it's there in subtle ways that you might not, that might not be blatant. Often there's a challenge to stereotype because one thing when um, the disability art and culture movement really began, began to emerge with the disability rights movement in the 1970s, one of the things that disability art and culture did was to bring people together across impairment types to try to understand what we had in common. Because before that time we were working um, you know, in relation to different groups that were related to specific impairments. So blind folks um, had an organization for blind folks and their, their own thing. And, people with cerebral palsy or people with spina bifida. But then when we came together as a political minority, we had to figure out what do we have in common? Why are we a group? Doesn't always even make sense that we're a group. But that's where we've had to do a lot of self-conscious building of what is a disability identity and culture. And one way we've done that is through challenging stereotypes, uh, trying to understand ourselves in relation to how the world has portrayed us. And by understanding how the world has portrayed us, trying to figure out who we are in relation to that, but also in relation to each other. And so the film I'm going to show you today is one of those projects of figuring out um, how the world has portrayed us and what we have to say about it. There's a focus on the lived experience of disability. Most of the time when you see disability and representation, no matter what art form you're talking about or what type of representation, Disability has a meaning. Disability doesn't ever just appear without a metaphor being attached to it in some way. And that fil the film I'm showing you also explores that. And that's been a huge barrier for artists with disabilities. So for instance, my background is in theater and performance, and there are very few trained actors with disabilities. And one of the reasons why it's difficult to have an arts career as a disabled performing artist is because you're considered not to be a flexible performer. There, first of all, there are not very many roles for us. And then when those roles are available, does the person have the very specific gender and race or um, ethnic identity that goes along with that role? And unless someone's really willing to cast against type, there are just very few roles. And then if the role is not written for a person with a disability and you're in that role, the director can feel like you're a distraction. And I've had this happen, heard this many times. So they're like, the audience is going to be wondering why that character is disabled the whole time. Right? So it's just a distraction. So that's what has been told to us. Or it's, just, it's going to make a statement of some kind. Or the audience is going to be confused. It's sort of like that 
um, Stanislavski thing where if there's a gun on stage that you see in the first act, you know it's going to go off. And that's kind of like what it is with disability. Audience is going to see the disability and because we've been conditioned to think that disability is relevant to the plot somehow or it means something, the audience is going to be searching the whole time for that meaning. So that's been a barrier. When I was a professor at Florida State, before I went to Chicago, I was in a theater department and we did a play that was about a group of college guys who were into partying and that, that was the play. The college guys were into partying too, so that made a nice match. But um, before the show um, went up, one of the actors broke his leg and there was no understudy. So the, the director and other folks in the department were really worried, what are we going to do? Even though he was capable of performing. So what they decided to do, and I know I'm being recorded, so <laughs> this is no name shall be mentioned. This was a long time ago. Um, decided to add a scene to the play that explained why the character was on crutches and had a broken leg. And the way it was just, and that's not even, that's not even really legal, right? Because it's messing with the copyright. But they felt like it, if they didn't make a justification in the narrative, the audience would just be confused the whole time. And so they said the scene was that the guy in a, in a, in a drunken stupor fell down the stairs and broke his leg. So then like a moral was attached to his injury and his broken leg. So this is just, I, I raise this anecdote because it shows just how it entrenched it is in our viewing practices as audience that that disability better be explained. I want to know what happened to that person, why they're disabled, and what it has to do with anything. So that's another um, barrier. So when we focus on the lived experience of disability, we're talking about things that are not a metaphor for somebody else, not a me metaphor for non-disabled people's otherness or outsiderness or you know this moral failings or inspiration. But what is the actual complexity of the lived experience. Um, and the development of alternative aesthetics based on the particularities of the bodies and minds of people with disabilities. So we're really interested in ways that our presence and our perspectives can create new aesthetic possibilities rather than being in the arts in a way that's adaptive. So I am doing a lot of work in dance right now, in physically integrated dance and disability dance. And the way this might play out is some of the earlier work in integrated dance was adaptive, or you could think of it as making an accommodation. So you might see choreography, like um, a good example from a group called Momenta in the Chicago area is a tango, which is a partnered gendered dance. And the male dancer is in a wheelchair, and he is an amputee, the two, the two legs. Um, and then a, a, a non-disabled female dancer. And you know the tango, right? You, you know, you, that's in your mind what that cultural script is. So when in a typical integrated dance, an adaptation to the choreography is made, so the dancer who uses a wheelchair, um, his movement is an adaptation of what the standard choreography is, or the choreography you've come to expect. And when that happens, we're not really seeing what comes natively or naturally from a disabled person's body. It's the way the, the form has been adapted. What we're trying to do is to come up with choreography and movement from the way our bodies move through the world. So starting with disability, starting with the way someone experiences movement in a chair, the way gender is experienced as someone who moves through the world using a wheelchair. And that dance will look very different than something that's adaptive. So you can think about disability art as kind of starting with disability, not always about access and inclusion. That's important. But what does it mean when access and, and inclusion is assumed? And you start with disability and you build out from there. Does that make sense? OK. And that's why I'm excited to see Antoine and Barbara's work today. Um, so I um, have an artist residency program at UIC, and I just wanted to show you some of the artists that I work with. I work with up to two artists a year, and the artists develop a project based on what they decide they would like the next step in their career to be. And so this is Riva Lair, the painter I was telling you about earlier. And um, she did this painting of another UIC faculty member, Leonard Davis. Um, I'm just, I'm, I can't, I don't have time to talk too much about these artists, but I'd, I'd love for you to go 
Google them and find out more about them. But Reva, her projects are, are about specifically not objectifying uh, the people that she paints. So how do you make portraits of people with disabilities when we have been so um, objectified and not having control of how we're seen? So that's how she works. Um, this is Robert Schleifer, who is a deaf theater artist, and he did an American Sign Language translation of the play Art. Um, and that play is originally written in French and then in English, and then he translated it into ASL. So it became a play about communication. This is Barack Ade Soleil, and he did a choreography project that explored the intersections between African American, black, and male identities. This is um, Arlene Malinowski. She is a solo performance artist and an actor, and the project she did for us was working on her one-woman show, which is called A Little Bit Not Normal. And in that, that one-woman show, she explores the experiences of being a person with mental illness who was raised, a hearing person raised in a deaf family. So then you have intersections where um, disability isn't just located in one type of impairment, but in, you know, it's people are complicated. So not just one disability per person. Um, this is Chris Lenzo, actually the dancer I was mentioning who does that tango piece. And this was his project he did for the residency working with a choreographer. And he wanted to create new work that was what we were calling sustainable choreography. Um, a lot of disabled dancers tend to do things that are very athletic and virtuosic, which can then cause new injuries and new impairments. So we were working on choreography that works with a person's body so that they don't further injure themselves and so that they can keep working. And this is Matt Baudet, the artist I most recently worked with. And he did a series of multimedia performance art pieces in which he explored his experiences with schizophrenia. And an interesting thing in, in one of his installations, he was working with audio describers and he, there, it was a visual installation and there were three screens with images all at once. And so with the audio description, it couldn't really be described by one person. So we then hired three audio describers. And as it turned out, he said, this is like having the voices in my head. So by including access and accommodation, it created a new dimension to his piece that was reflective of his experience that he hadn't considered. So now I'm going to show you the, a bit of my work. And this is the collaborators, um, Salome Chasnoff, Susan Nussbaum, Ali Patsavis, and Jersey Rose. We've been working on this since 2010. Um, I'm not a filmmaker. Film, make, film has this rolling horizon. <laughs> I'm a theater person, you know, curtain goes up. But we're really excited about it being finished by the end of the summer. And I've brought a 30 minute segment for you today. It's a rough cut and it's not necessarily going to look like what it's going to be when we're completely done with it, but it'll give you a taste of what it's going to be. Um, and it's partly inspired by a large disability in American film class I teach at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and eventually it will come with a curriculum for higher education that's a 15-week curriculum, and it will include outtakes that didn't make it into the film, and we'll also have curriculum for community screenings. Um, it was started by a series of salons that Salome and Susan did around the city of Chicago that brought together film clip, clips and then had um, disabled people discuss them. And then we had a research and community engagement phase where we did these salons all over the city with different diverse disabled audience members. And then what we wanted to do in this film was to give a sense of the disability community's collective response. I like to call it a collective representational retribution. It's like our revenge on Hollywood. And you'll see we've got that tone in the film. And then we had a Kickstarter campaign to complete the film, and this is part of that work. So um, I'll get started on the film. And I do notice there's some children in the audience, and um, there, there is stuff, and there's some nudity, and some violence, and some language in the film. So just to be aware, um, if that will be done with it in 30 minutes in case that's not something that's good for you. All right, so enjoy. Thank you. Questions, comments, thoughts? Yes? Sure, from the other Carrie. Yes. The other Carrie in the audience. Um, so you're starting to touch on representation a little bit. I anticipate you'll go deeper into that in a moment in the film. But what does it mean to you to have 
takes a little, there's a little delay. It, it'll come on. It's green. Okay, there you go. So you start to talk about representation in the film, and I anticipate you're going to go a little deeper into that, into the full-length film. But could you and talk about the decision, the the the, the politics of whether an um, in a, particularly in film, the disabled character should be disabled or not. Um, set aside the um, ethnicity issue or the race issue, but just focus on disability. And I'm particularly thinking about Glee, for example. We have, um, and the politics about having someone who's not disabled portray a disabled character. What are the politics of that, and how do we think that through? That's a really good question. Um, and in a lot of my advocacy work, I do advocacy for artists with disabilities, clearly, and also, um, especially in theater and performance, which is my background. And most film actors get their training in theater departments, so it was something that I've worked on a lot in terms of curriculum and, and those sorts of issues. And I've had to think about this in a bit, maybe in a way that might not always be popular with a lot of my fellow advocates. So I'm going to say something a little unpopular. It's going on camera. <laughs> But my un unpopular opinion is that I think we need to be really careful when we call for disabled actors in disabled roles when these films are so stereotypical that it might be a way of making them seem even more authentic. Or there might be a way in which there's no, no longer a gap between representation and actual disabled bodies. And it might look like we're endorsing these movies. So for instance, in Me Before You, the um, character who's quadriplegic, he lives in a castle. He has money to travel the entire world. He falls in love with his PA and she says it's the best six months of his life. And yet he still wants to kill himself at the end. There's no apparent reason. He has all the health care. He's supposedly ex experiencing pain and suffering, but in the movie there's, he has like, I don't know, amazing futuristic health care so it doesn't even seem like he's suffering it's not there in the movie but there's a logic to that that no matter how good a disabled person's life is or how many resources it's still logical they want to die and so having an actual disabled person in the role I think might even be dangerous because it seems like that's something that's real and um, the logic of that is destructive um, and it's, I want to see more complex stories that we can ha inhabit more authentically, and I know that's difficult when you're thinking about Hollywood. But even in thinking about um, theater, I got a call from a, a well-known theater company um, who was doing a Christmas Carol, and they really wanted to hire a disabled child to play Tiny Tim, and they asked me to help them find an actor who could play that role, and I didn't, I, you know, sometimes things come out of your mouth. And I said, I will not help you. That would be a form of child abuse. And I was like, ooh, that was kind of a thing to say. But what that, what that came from was my own experience of having been um, in charity advertising and, and cast as the pathetic disabled child that needs to raise money at Christmas. I was in a Christmas campaign as a child. And you get all this attention and this glory, and then you realize when you get older, oh, I was raising money or making you know, I'm so odious that a whole play is built around people being nice to me. You know, so it, it has this weird psychological effect, and I didn't want a disabled child to go through that. So I wouldn't help them. So it was, in, and then the person said to me, We were just doing what you've been advocating for. We went to one of your talks, and this is what you said. And I was like, Oh, yeah, I did. Um, so I was starting to think in a bit more of a nuanced way about that. Um, and also being having um, been in a theater program, and I did some research for the National Endowment for the Arts on arts careers for people with disabilities. And there are very, very few trained actors with disabilities. They're just very few. In fact, I know most of the MFAs of students with significant physical disabilities. There are far more deaf actors, because there are deaf training programs in deaf theater, but not so many with other types of impairments. So there's just not that many of us. Um, but there's some really exciting work going on in alternative, uh, independent films, and there's a lot of foreign films that are actually, I think, don't have the same, perhaps, American tropes that we're used to, the pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and individualism. So I don't know. I, I, 
of course I want disabled actors and disabled those, and I'm not going to stop advocating for that. But I think we also need to be careful about what we ask for. Right. Can everyone hear me? Welcome back. OK, so um, uh, for the next part of our program, we will be seeing Antoine Hunter. Um, and at the end, we will be hearing from Barbara Barnes, a local visual artist. Um, and uh, you can, she's been outside with her work um, all along, so she's happy to chat with people at any point. Um, I also just briefly wanted to give a plug for an audio description project that's happening here at the Nasher called the Dada Project, where they are working to make uh, public art uh, visually accessible to the visually impaired. Um, so if anyone has any questions about that, you can find Dan Ellison. He's right here in the front row, the gentleman with the gray hair and the beard. <laughs> We love you, Dan. Um, <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I will be introducing um, Antoine Hunter. Um, he's a Bay Area native. He's an award-winning, internationally known African-American deaf choreographer, dancer, instructor, speaker, and deaf advocate who performed throughout the Bay Area and the world, including Europe, Africa, and South America. Crowned king of the San Francisco Carnival, 2017, an esteemed keynote speaker for Kennedy Center's VSA 2017 Intersection Conference on Arts and Special Education, Hunter has been featured on the front cover of Deaf Life, In Dance Spirit, Dance Teacher, Dance Magazine, and in Oakland North, 48 Hills, CNN's Great Big Story, and KQED Arts. He is former president of Bay Area Black Deaf Advocates and director at large for North Carolina Association of the Deaf. Hunter actively supports Deaf Hope, an organization whose mission is to end domestic and sexual violence in deaf communities through empowerment and education. He teaches dance and ASL in both hearing and deaf communities and is the founder artistic director of Urban Jazz Dance Company and has been producing the Bay Area International Deaf Dance Festival since 2013. His projects have been awarded funding by Cash Theater Bay Area, the Zellerbach Family Foundation, California Arts Council, and SF Arts Commission. Mr. Hunter is a rare spirit who believes in the humanity arts as one of the most uh, powerful tools on earth to instigate change and spread awareness. Welcome, Mr. Hunter. Thank you, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Can you see me OK? Yeah. So well, maybe people are asking for a little more light up front. Could we do that? Is that possible? Let there be light. <laughs> very cool, very cool. Well, thank you so much for coming here. Oh, wow. I feel such a warm experience now. Much better, right? Great, awesome. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I thought, you know, I may not arrive because my flight was actually canceled, then it got delayed, and then that one got canceled, and I was crossing my fingers hoping that we would get here on time, and now I'm here. So yay, so excited about that. Um, so such a beautiful campus here, so nice. I, I love the sun. Where I'm from in San Francisco, it can be quite cloudy at times. So in California, of course, you think it's always sunny, but that's not always the case. Oftentimes we have rains and it's windy. Right now it's cold, but here you have such nice weather. And I'm so impressed with that. So nice here. But I am really uh, here just to share kind of my life story with you. I'm not going to do it in a lecture format. I want to have a conversation with you. I want to have a back and forth. So if you feel like uh, during my presentation, you know, you want to interject, raise your hand, have any questions, don't feel like you have to hold on to that question to the end of the presentation. You know, I got to get it out, got to get it out. Raise that hand up. Let's have a conversation here. You know, but maybe, maybe I will not answer your question right away, but I do want to have this conversation. We will have a discussion. Okay, we good? Everybody good so far? Okay. So I'm going to teach you. How many of you know sign language here? Any signers in the audience? What? Uh, okay, I'm going to teach you some sign, okay? All right, put your hand out like this. Everybody put your hand out like this. And go like this. That means yes. Put your hand out like this. Do that. That means no. 
Right. So if I say, are you understanding me? Then you say yes or no. So either way, that way you can have audience feedback. Are we good? Are we good? Okay, there we go. Good job. All right, so now we're having a conversation. Very cool. So again, my name is Antoine. My name sign is this right here. Put your hand out, put your hand out. Make an A, make a fist, and dance that A on the top of your hand. Antoine, that's me. So I was actually born deaf, and I love being deaf. It's beautiful, right? It's just like, I love being a big African American, right? I'm from Oakland, California, and that's the home of the Black Panthers. So a very, very cool piece of history. That town is a very uh, valuable community. Very valuable community, especially with art. We value people, and it has taught me so much. And all of that community has been included inside of myself. So when I'm watching that community, how they work together, and whenever I see that, that taught me how I can teach and work with other people, a lot of dif different communities, how we can all work together. So you understand so far? Good? Very cool. So something that's really interesting is I am very, very poetic. So when I like to express myself, and then whenever I express myself to my deaf friends, they're like, hmm, that guy's a little weird. So when I, when I talk to my hearing friends and I express myself, they look at me and they said, I, have no, I don't know science, I don't know what he's doing, he's obviously weird. So I'm kind of in, the, in between both worlds and it's, it's different for me. So the world tries to say that I have to find that I am the same as others. And oftentimes I feel left out. But really, art itself is something that saved my life. It brought a different world together for me. You know, we had all of these different worlds that I was experiencing. And people were like, how did you bring all that together? How did art, how was art your savior? How did it save your life? Bringing all these worlds together inside me. Well, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to show you how that happened. That's what I'm talking about. And that's what we're going to talk about. And that's the goal of disability, deaf cultures, uh, blindness, wheelchairs, all of that. And developing art. We can combine all of those different cultures and communities together. And it's such a beautiful thing, right? There we go. So society often tries to say, oh, let's give us a label. You know, let's, let's include everybody in one. But really, if you look at this picture, do you mind giving an audio description of this right here? So this says, this title known as, this title shown as social norms with a picture of a group of males with glasses, short hair, a long nose that are duplicates of each other. But my, my question is, is that reality? No. Right? Thanks for the feedback. <laughs> so that's not real. Every, some people have long hair. Some people have short hair. Some people have it shaved on one side with it curled over. Some people have long locks like I do. So we, we are all different. Some have glasses. Some don't. And guess what? You all are beautiful. It's true. It is very true. <sighs> So me, growing up, I had all of these different worlds that I was trying to combine inside of me. And I kind of felt left out of the box. A lot of people want you to stay within the lines. You need to stay in this little box over here, that little box over there. But honestly, as a minority, I had a fear. Why was I afraid? So that's my question for you. Why fear? This right here. Right there, at cast by those who fear us. Why do they fear us? People 
And that's one. Yeah, that's one perspective. Any others? Fear. Why do they fear us? Very good. Excellent. Great. Any others? Other perspectives? Throw them out. We might be that ourselves and the fear that we might become that because it's unknown, uncertain. Exactly. Wonderful. Wonderful answer. Any others? That they might have to help. We might have to help or contribute or take care of or put ourselves out or be touched in some way to try to communicate that we're not these two ones. Mm. Here on the front row. I'm going to say the wrong thing and I'm going to offend you somehow and therefore easier just to not pay attention. Exactly. Great. So can some deaf people can see the, all the deaf people can see the interpreter? We're good. I want to make sure that no one's left out. So if you can't see the interpreter, please let me know and we'll move it around. Wave your hand. I can't see the interpreter. That's, that's totally okay. Let me know. So you guys are my new Duke family, right? Right? So we need to show support to each other. Okay. Well, what you said was right. But what you said was right. Was right. You all were right. Yeah. Yeah. They have this, this fear. This fear that something, honestly, I don't understand. But the important thing is that most of the time when people don't understand, they try to avoid it because they don't understand it. Because they don't know what to do. Because that, that understanding and lack of knowledge turns into fear. So make your hands like this. Copy me right now. Make your hands like this and then shake it in front of your body. That's the sign for fear. Sign this. This is the sign for understand. Understand fear. So which feels more calm? Which sign? Right? This one right here. Understand. Fear? No, that doesn't feel like a calm sign at all. That, that feels like as you're bringing stress or work to the body. So it's okay. It's okay to be afraid, but you have to work through it, right? So it's not, we need to get uncomfortable with something new. We need to, we need to make sure that we become uncomfortable until it's something that we understand. So the outcast by those who command to bring normal power to their hand. Oh, you you need to you need to be normal. You need to fit in a group. Outcast by those who don't understand who we are. And honestly, we need to listen to other people, to each other. So if I don't understand another individual that I'm speaking with, if I don't understand about something about who they are. So for example, I don't call myself handicapped. That's not, a, that's not a term that I use. I don't call myself hearing impaired. That's not my identity. My identity is deaf. That's who I am. I'm deaf or I'm hard of hearing. I'm not handicapped. I'm not hearing impaired. So when somebody else says, uses that those labels, then to me, I look at myself and I know who I am. So in, in all situations, I try to do that. I try to respect others in whatever, they, whatever labels they use as well. So for instance, a lot of people say, oh, you're the problem. And I try to say, no, you're the one who's labeling. So for example, within deaf culture, we have, and within blind culture, do we have problems? Are we the problem? Are we the problem? No. So we have deaf, bipolar, we have TBI, PTSD, Down syndrome. So we're all in a position of power. So the, the reality is, is, is when it, as it comes down to it, we're all different. So who knows the X-Men, right? Have you seen the X-Men? So each of you should know the wonderful hero has to learn how to use their power, right? And also, each of them have to teach 
the community at large, who they are. That's a part of the story. So how to work with them. So for example, we have Wolverine, right? Wolverine. So that's something that we do. Wolverine. So Wolverine, one of his instructions is, don't come behind me. So we're out walking. And of course, somebody taps you on the shoulder, immediately he turns around, the, the flies out of his hands. So a lot of individuals with PTSD struggle with the same thing. So whenever you come behind an individual, if you know a person uh, that is like that, is it a good idea to come behind them and pound them on the shoulder? No, it's not a good idea to come behind them because of course the first reaction is gonna be just like Wolverine. So what I do typically is I take a wide berth, come around in front of them, get eye contact, and respect their disability, have a communication with them. But if you don't listen, then the first thing that you're going to think of is, oh, I tapped you on the shoulder. You respond like that. You're the problem. And so the reality is because of that, they are rejected. So for, for many years of Wolverine's life, he felt rejected. He felt like he had no place. And obviously that's a tough position to be in. Now a lot of people look at him as a hero for his strength. He had that healing power but he always felt in pain forever because of the, the fact that he was rejected. You understand me so far? So we need to find the connection. We don't need to label people as problems, but find out how we can solve those problems. And I'm a teacher, right? I'm a teacher, so I love to teach. So I love to teach how we can work together. Many times people think that we have one topic that works for everyone, one theme that can work for everyone, but that's not true. Not true. America tried to, uh, or, America tries to do a one model fits all, pushing social norm expectation and disgruntledness while and if providing full accessibility. So we have all these different avenues that we're teaching. When it's a general, we have all different types of people. We are, so me as a teacher, so I have to show and interact. And once I teach, then you can teach me and we teach each other and we learn from each other. So that's how we match accessibility. And then they can grow, then I can grow, then they can grow and we're, we're passing it on to each other. So I have a lot of lot of different lot of different ways that we can learn. And I've already explained a little bit about listening, but that's something that we need to continue to do. Not listening to each other. Obviously we're not going to experience growth. That's the bottom line. The most important thing is the different schools of education, different thoughts. So we obviously need those schools of education to try to grow, to help us understand. So how many of you are leaders? One leader in the whole group, right? How many leaders? I'm looking. Come on. So how many of you work with children? How many of you work with teachers? Right? How many of you work in, in the law firm, in a law firm? Like in a legal firm, in the legal field? How many of you work with scientists or work with science? Right, I'm looking, I'm looking. So we have to understand that we have to work with people to break the boundaries, to grow their understanding. So when, when they want to compartmentalize us and to limit, limit us to, to boxes, we have to help them understand that the fact is it's not one size fits all. And then that the fact is that we can be creative and we can continue to be creative artists. And we, they can t we can teach ourselves and then in retrospect, we can help teach them.
Be open. Be open. Be flexible. Not to mean flexible as in a physical sense, right? That's not what I'm talking about. But be flexible mentally. Have flexibility of the mind. Have flexibility of the spirit. So what do you think the sign is for fear? Remember, what was the sign for fear? This sign right here, fear. That means that everything inside of you is so tight. And you need to be flexible, you need to work it out. So I want you to try it with me, right? So this is a sign for fear. Act like, I'm, so I'm gonna move it around. We're gonna loosen it up. We're gonna move it out, right? To the point to where we're flexible. There you go. There you go. So what does that feel like? What does it feel like now at this point? Dancing, right? What else does it feel like? Relaxation, yes. Right there. Freedom. Oh, I love that word. Love it. More words. Flying. Cool word. Yeah, flying. What is the opposite of flying? Could be falling, but... Not falling, but... Swimming. <laughs> so how many of you feel like you're in the water when you're doing this, right? It kind of feels like you're in the water. There's no limits in the water, right? You can flow with it. You can grow with it. You can be flexible. You can move around. You have everything that you can do. The cycle of growth. That's something that's happening. You understand me so far? Good? That's what it takes to be a leader. You get that support. So as my time as president for the Black Deaf Advocates, I found I had to get support behind me, but sometimes when I turned around, it didn't really work that way. There was nobody there. So I had to communicate with people and garner support that way and go forward with people alongside me and not behind me. And then we could march forward. Yes. For me, it was like, yes, with the hand over my ear. That's a deaf pride thing. Really? I thought a leader would be me pulling everyone behind me. But it doesn't work. You all have to pull together and move forward alongside each other. And that's what we can do. Yeah. Oh.
men, women, girls, boys. We have to try to imagine and not put people in those boxes. I'm here to tell you those boxes need to go away. It does not have to be that way. You can be whatever you want to be. He, she, it. If that's who you are, you should be that. In my situation, I was told that I was handicapped. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm deaf. And you all have your own identities of who you want to become. We're like spiders. Maybe you can become a unicorn. If that's your identity, go for it. You understand yourself best. And you understand your relationship with your world. For parents and children, for teachers and students, for a boss and a worker, we need to help each other we need to establish relationships with each other so we understand each other better. You know who you are. And when you know that, you can love yourself even better. Those two hands you had up, use them to push and pull and stop and let go. Try that with me. Push, pull, Stop and let go. Push, pull, stop, let go. Push, pull, stop, let go. And look at yourself deep inside. I am me. I'm human. I live like everyone else. I have a fire inside me. And that fire burns. your hands up. Go ahead. We can become one fire right now. Put your hands up. We are a flame. You look beautiful. Whether you're blind, whether you're in a wheelchair, whether you have brown, blue, yellow, red skin, I love each and every one of your colors. It doesn't matter if you're short. It doesn't matter if you're tall. You might see a weather difference. <laughs> But you can see things that other people can't. Maybe you can smell better than other people. You can smell things other people can't. For me, I can't hear, but I hear things other people can't hear. So love yourselves and learn your own power. You are beautiful. Put your hands like this. Beautiful. You are. You are. You are. Awesome. I'm a 
teacher. So I always say students. But I'm also a student. We're always teaching each other. We're students to each other. And you are beautiful. Feels good, right? Yeah. Inclusive, a Microsoft Design Toolkit. Antoine Hunter, deaf advocate, dance teacher, choreographer. I am a Nia Opes e Obidi Hene, father and dance advocate healer. I got one time I had a really wonderful job offer and I had to go to rehearsal practice. The only issue was the door. Antoine, a tall, lean man with a beard, approaches an office building door and pushes numbers on an intercom keypad. In an interview, he signs. I don't know what to say. I can't hear them. Antoine presses his hand over the intercom speaker. So I talked about the problem. They wouldn't hire me because it felt like there was too much energy just to have someone to let me in. So the big question, that was a cool job I wanted. Wow. And that was a, that's the bell sometimes. Using a smartphone, Antoine and a friend signed to each other. I feel like as the kids, we accept each other so easy, and that we are taught not to accept each other. We're taught that we're so different, like, in a bad way, you know. And we're taught that being deaf is a problem. It's not a problem. It's a different culture. Antoine returns to his high school. I got in high school. Miss Chain, my dance teacher, she said, everyone needs to create a piece, a group dance. I'm out, Kai. No one really want to work with me. I'll do a solo. Okay, do a solo. So I was trying to come up with an idea. I did a solo choreography with Whitney Houston, I Will Always Love You. I was dancing, I was nervous, dancing. And then, you know, in the middle of that song, that's the instrumental uh, break. And I didn't have to worry about the words. And it was just moving, da, 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 da. and something electric just came to my body. And it was moving, you know what I mean? The pain, the suffering, the getting through the things that I was trying to make it from day to day. And then the music finished, it was like, and people stopped and looked at me. And then it was like, oh yeah, it was so cool. And then my teacher was like, what do you think of that dance? What did you feel? And people were saying, oh, I felt like it was cold. I felt like it was trapped. She was suffering. And it was like, they were saying all the words that I was thinking and feeling. Yeah, that's exactly what I felt. That was communication. I fell in love right there. Antoine applauds by lifting both hands and shaking them. With music, I use a lot of bars that move for volume. On stage with musicians, Antoine strikes a graceful pose. I just want to see it. He touches the instruments. I see Mark and Shelby, he's like... He mimes playing a cello. And then I see the piano guy going... He sways. And my body records it. I memorize it really well. Antoine starts to move. I just start putting it all together, creating my own instrument so I can dance with everyone. Shirtless, Antoine shows his muscular arms and torso as he reaches, dances, turns, and kicks in rhythm. Even though I really want to know what that music they're doing, I'm fine, I'm satisfied because I made mine. I have my voice, I have my music, and I'm with them. And it only happened without my hearing aid. I was able to listen to myself more. Wow, I started hearing my body. In a class, Antoine's teenage students move in slow motion, stretching their bodies. 
been alone for a long time, and I really don't want people to be alone. That feeling is awful, really. Antoine teaches a class to teenage girls. The students copy his movements. And so I'm always trying to bring people together. The dancers do slow hip rolls. They stretch their arms and gently wiggle their fingers, then strike poses in a group. As class ends, everyone claps. Antoine signs thank you and bows to his students. On a playground, a woman gives Antoine a hug. Later, he signs to a young mother as her toddler sits in a stroller. I will stay tell people to take a minute to listen to your style. Keep going, go for it, keep fighting, and then you'll discover something that will be awakened and blow up. And you'll be like, what is that? What was that? That's, that, that's your voice, that's your music, that's your spirit. Antoine steps into an empty theater with rows of red seats. On stage, he stands in front of a white screen, undulating his arms. His long dreadlocks fly as he spins around. My biggest dream is hopefully one big opera theater and international dancers are coming and we learning from them. And we're giving role models to the kids, you know, give one to my daughter. And keep on inspiring each other, keep bringing each other up. A spotlight casts Antoine's shadow onto the white screen. With a serene smile, he takes a bow. Titles. This is part of a film series created to build empathy and inspire designers. Inclusive, a Microsoft Design Toolkit. A Slanted Light production, Microsoft. Applause. I'm doing applause into a microphone that picks up sound. That didn't work. Let there be light. I'm deaf. I didn't know there was something else going on. Sorry. <laughs> there was music and I had no idea, but anyway, okay. Um, wow. This video is what part of what I use to help people educate how to be around me. After that, I showed that to people and they started accepting me better because I educated them and I taught them who I am instead of them teaching me who I am. Not just a dancer. I'm not only a dancer, but parents, family man, teacher, uh, the list just goes on. I have to teach society who I am. And there are many places that are not for us where deaf dancers can necessarily go and perform. So I had to create a place. That's why I'm the director of the Bay Area International Deaf Festival. So people from all over the world who are deaf can come and perform on a real stage with real lights and a real audience like you who believe in art advocacy. It's really important that we have our own place to share and educate. And we have to be open to that so that our fears can become an understanding. Yeah. Understand? So really, thank you so much for listening to my story and thank you for sharing your personality and sharing your flame I started to see differences in personality and see the stories behind your movements not all of you have the same flame they're different some of you had flames like this and some more like this some of you are way up here I could see it. Some of you were closing your eyes and really feeling it. Every one of you was different. So thank you for sharing that. It 
was beautiful. So that's my presentation today, and I thank you. I only have a few minutes left, just a few minutes. But if anyone has any questions, this is a safe place, a safe place to ask questions. You can ask me anything but, 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 I won't tell you my age. It's the Bay Area International Deaf Festival, that one, dance festival. It, it happens annually in during the second week of August, that weekend. So it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday when we have performances. It's But the 8th and the 9th, we have workshops. Like a deaf teacher will teach salsa. That was really cool last year. I know how to salsa, but... When a deaf teacher explained it, my mind was blown. <laughs> oh my gosh, it felt so good. I was like, oh, like this, oh, like this. Okay, I got it now, I got it. I mean, there are different kinds of workshops that are beautiful. So far we have someone from Australia, Hong Kong, Colombia, Venezuela, Russia, Germany, Chile is going to be represented. We have more this year. So this year will be the sixth year. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for the applause. Really, the first three years, I really did it by myself without support. I had to use all of my workshop classes to gather information and everyone came and danced and then everyone went home happy and inspired yeah other questions There's have you ever come to the American Dance Festival here in Durham have I ever come to the American sorry American Dance Festival here. I haven't. I haven't. When is it? I wish you would come here. <laughs> I should. Am I good enough? Am I good enough for that? <laughs> I love you guys. At Duke University. Y'all are awesome. You're so cool. I'm going to put that on my Facebook. Duke said I was cool. <laughs> They're cool too. Just so you know, Madonna came to the American Dance Festival when she was just a student um, oh. many years ago. So <laughs> you can follow her footsteps. I love Madonna. <laughs> love. <laughs> yeah. That. She also went to Paul Taylor Dance Company. That's in New York, and I was involved with that school as well. So that's pretty nice. <laughs> then she took it to the club. <laughs> Madonna is cool. Thank you. And thank you, too. Other questions? Don't feel like there are any stupid questions here, because there are none. Over 30 years of teaching, I love all questions. So, one question. I'm not going to ask the age, of course. <laughs> but I want to ask about um, your family and growing up. Um, do your brothers and sisters, how do you communicate with your family? I'm just curious. In terms of my family growing up, most of my family is hearing. I'm the only, I was the only deaf child in my family. My mom looked and looked to find the right school placement for me. And she didn't feel like deafness was a problem or that I needed a cure. 
I mean, it's not like wearing glasses. You know, when you take them off, you can't see, and you put them on, and then all of a sudden you can see, and you can go on with your life. But if you can't hear, you just go on with your life. So I have two, well, I grew up in a house with 11 women, and I'm the oldest, uh, and we had one bathroom. <laughs> At 4 a.m. in the morning, I went into the bathroom to get ready for school. I will not lie. If you tried well, to get in the bathroom when they were already in there, it was over. You couldn't get in. I mean, it was a constant stream of people using the bathroom. Like, you just traded off really quick. And I would stand there going, uh, do I get a turn? No, the girls just, it was like the changing of the guard in there. So, so I got up at 4 a.m., and it worked, so that's why I was like, I, that's probably why I still wake up at 4 a.m. trying to think of it. To go to the bathroom, I still get up. I think I was just trained, <laughs> ingrained. I don't know. But I had a really loving family. You saw in the video, there was a girl drummer, a female drummer. That's my sister. She performed for Sheila E., if you know Sheila E, right? She's the queen of percussion. She's performed with Prince and other really famous artists. My sister is amazing. When we were growing up, we butted heads. Until she got a drum and I started dancing. Then we connected so much better, oh my gosh. Then it was like this. It was no, there was no work. We could, it didn't matter. We could communicate. She would drum and I would dance and that was our communication. We had a conversation that way. I am not making this up. It's true. We got along from then on, ever since. To get her to do something like that on video, to be videoed was really tough. Cause she drums, she chews gum while she drums. <laughs> She, play, she can play eight drums all at once. And I, we watch each other, we connect visually. I watch her drumming and chewing gum, and I dance and take a bow. Yeah, we have a great, we had a conversation that way through dance and drumming, a good conversation. And that's one of the things that I was talking about, using art as a means of teaching communication. It's really important. Art is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I have two minutes left, right? I'm checking with my timekeeper. Yeah. Um, what made you decide that dancing was for you? What turned you on to dancing? I was trying to communicate with the hearing world and the deaf world, and when I saw dance, I realized it could make me a member of both communities. The world just didn't understand me and I felt left out. I felt like I couldn't express myself any other way. And when you can't express yourself, you go crazy, right? So when I danced, it was another way to communicate and express myself. Now I came very, very close to suicide. I love my family, know that. But when you can't connect with the world and find a place in the world, I felt like I didn't want to be part of the world because there was nowhere to really go why, and I couldn't figure out why I was here. But when I danced, I started to express myself and people started to understand me. And that, f you've been afraid, you understand what I mean about fear but I started connecting better with the world and it saved my life. Dancing literally saved my life. And then I wanted to learn different kinds of dance that related to different cultures. So I went to Africa and learned dance there. I went to Peru and learned dance there. Everywhere. It made me feel alive. And I wanted to make sure that dance as an art can save other people's lives too. Wow, thank 
you. Can I give you a hug? Thank you. Beautiful. Can I show it? So much energy here. So much movement represented on the page. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antoine. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our third speaker. Barbara Barnes is a visual artist with Art Images Live um, right down the road in Carborough, North Carolina. She creates live art sketches inspired by motion, activity, gestures, interactions, and performances. And we've already seen uh, one example of the kind of work that Barbara produces. Um, Barnes earned a BFA in painting from Syracuse University with a Ford Foundation grant. Later, earning a therapeutic recreation associate degree, she worked to expand recreation and arts programming for disabled persons, seniors, and children residing in rural communities in Carteret County, North Carolina. In 2013, she was awarded an Orange County, North Carolina Fall Project Grant to draw and paint a visual music series. Uh, since then, she has completed several thousand drawings each year, representing the musical performances of thousands of different bands. From December 2011 until recently, Art Images Live has been insp an inspiring focal point of a new gesture art, painting, and performing visual artist project. Barnes says that her lifetime of learning abilities, creative skills and experiences is making it possible to share creatively, not as a disabled person, but as an inspired visual artist, portraying performers sharing their talents within our communities. Welcome, Barbara. Well, I feel like I'm the least impressive as far as the degrees and <laughs> effect goes uh, experience but I'm I'm almost 64 and I'm really more like can I walk and people hear me um, I'm really more like a street artist I've lost everything so many times I can't even begin to tell you I've lost my abilities it wasn't a way for people to understand my disabilities because they're multiple. So I began to understand through drawing. I got a Ford Foundation grant to Syracuse University with almost no art training. It was from drawing prolifically since I could pick up a pencil. My speech was slow, my movement was slow, my ability to write was slow. I love to dance, but not my gift. <laughs> love to do theater, not my gift. Love to do music, not my gift. But they all made me feel whole. I give witness. Our Images Live is about witness. I'm creating portraits of people uh, I, I have four pages of art on Facebook. Some of my art on there goes back to when I'm six and seven years old. It's just a splattering. So, I, two years ago, I literally drew over 3,000 different bands. That doesn't include songwriters, comedians, comedian shows, music festivals. I drew at, to help raise funds. I draw for recovery festivals where there's musicians and performers and recoveries to help raise money. I, um, I am a woman who ran for my life because of abuse after when I was almost late 40s. I lost everything. But throughout my life, I have lost everything physically, and um, 
and other ways repeatedly. I could curl up in a corner. Yeah, this is in Carborough. You probably know uh, the station. This is one of their events. And these are drawings I do in about five minutes. When I draw a band, I draw, portray a whole band in about 45 minutes, I create a literal portrait. Just keep a literal. This is a rap um, artist. I drew at an open mic. A lot of people I draw could be no-name musicians or they could be famous. But a lot of times I don't know. I'm there like I was here just drawing. I'm hired sometimes and other times people just bring me in and uh, hire me to do an event or a wedding or a graduation or whatever. But this is kind of a splattering of the history and my art, but you'll see all of it has movement and most of it's ta tactile. I also did art for churches for 25 years, believe it or not. So I went from very Christian-based art to punk rock, heavy metal, <laughs> uh, classical, uh, you name it. And at the time I started this, I could not hear music. Music sounded like noise. I'd had a stroke, and I really couldn't hear music. I could kind of hear it. But as I drew people playing, this is uh, Diane with Pagan Hellcats, a senior band. <laughs> I often wondered why they were called Pagan Hellcats, but they were great. <laughs> blues, blues, very, very fast. But it teaches me to really look, really see, and really listen. If I'm up here, I cannot do this. I can, it, it's a, like, I have to totally focus on whoever or whatever I'm drawing on because the art is not based about what I'm thinking. It's based specifically, this is Eric. I sat at his feet. He was, um, um, you, uh, uh, it's again another performance and drew in about 20 minutes, but that allowed me to go into more detail. But I, again, I don't plan on com, uh, you know, doing the composition. I'm just like taking the first thing that grabs my attention, but I'm looking for basically how people hold themselves in a repeated pattern. Everyone has a repeated pattern. And I, I know you know, I know he knows. Because when we express ourselves, we all have movement unique to us. Um, I had been very, very ill and had to go through this treatment that made me just shot my bone marrow. And I made myself get up and walk up to Weaver Street every day. I walked a half mile. That might have might as well been 10 miles. I would not let myself go home until I drew somebody at Weaver Street. Sometimes I'd be there till midnight, you know? But slowly over time, without realizing it, I came to recognize how people move. And um, it wasn't something where if I look at you, people get self-conscious, right? If people do what they do, that's why I like to draw performers, they're natural in their bodies. And um, I've always done things with people with disabilities because I don't know how to speak, I don't think, or write most of the time with regular people. But for some reason, I could easily do a whole art program with adults who now retard or autism or people who were blind or could hardly move, some innate part of me knew how to adapt materials and other things so they could do it. But it was an interactive experience. Me just standing and talking is not interactive. Doing this art, when I forget about you and you forget about me, I create with full concentration. Live art is at its best when I can feel your movement, feel your movement. 
see your facial expression, and hear the tune you were humming. At that point, usually without realizing it, there's a creative connection that goes beyond an art form. And I've noticed a lot in groups of people, when doing this without even saying anything, I, it changes the energy or the creative connectedness. I think it gets us out of our own heads of always watching or listening, but when people are able to see me do it or see me doing it, they're wondering, what am I looking at? They start to see things differently, and I start to experience them without thinking differently. I have nothing. Um, I lost the most full use of my body two years ago. Uh, after doing all this, I lost almost full use of my hands, arms, and legs. I lost almost all the feeling in my hands and arms. I had no idea, the doctors didn't, if I would be able to walk, much less do anything else. That's a portrait I did of myself when I was about 17. Mm -hmm. But even then, without realizing it, even in stillness, there's movement. I see everything is changing all the time. Nothing is ever being the same. And I always experience the viewer is as much part of the art as the person who's doing it. So my art, that's how, the uh, first time I was pregnant, this piece is about this big. Mm -hmm. But again, it's done from life. Everything is done from something I feel within me, see, and experience movement with. And I can list a bunch of disabilities, but all I can say is after going through that, it was every time through searching for another way to interact, it's always been creative. And maybe like after I had the stroke, I could not move just my fingers, so I learned to draw with my body. It's very hard for me to sit and do this and draw with my fingers. After I lost feeling, I even did bigger, wider gesture with whole hands. Um, but I still could do the other gesture, but I had to simplify it because I couldn't work as fast. I am literally putting down every, you can keep going. <laughs> this is an oil I did. These are all ones I did about 35 years ago, but I'm again showing you, these are ones that were up here. These are just me putting down what I see. Nobody taught me how to do that. I did it by doing it. And I think most of us learn our art just by doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. And guess what? You're all artists. You're all creative. You give a testimony to that. We're all gifted in our own ways. A lot of people, this is just, these I do in church. And some are very abstract. Some are literal. I do them for, I just did Holy Week um, in about five churches a few years ago. They're all very different. They're again very fast, very in the moment, and they're part of something they don't take away from. You know, I'm really bad with technology. <laughs> at, at my age, I, I got a grant for a computer about six years ago and didn't know how to use it. And I did end up getting a grant <laughs> after that with the computer I didn't know how to use. And it was a nightmare. And I did not know how to scan art. With the grant, I got the scanner. Since then, I scanned and formatted probably eight, ten thousand dollars of drawings and such. I don't know. I still use mainly Microsoft Office. I hate to disappoint you all. I'm like, I got a Chrome notebook with one grant, and I got a Windows 7 with another, and now I have a Windows 10 laptop, and I have a Android smartphone. Technology is so important when, for me when I'm doing live art. When I'm out there, I didn't have a car for over 10 years. I did all the art on foot with a cart 
and bus and when I walk. I was gifted a car just recently. But so I've had to carry everything I've had with me. I already had had seven surgeries. So that limits how much and how I carry. It limits how many bags when I'm doing hopscotch music festival at King's and Neptune's and going up and down and up and down and up and down. It's hard. So I've learned to adapt not only my means of doing art, but integrating whatever it is into the art, adapting the supplies, adapting. Nobody knows me, you know. I came in the back door, and then I've been invited to do red carpet, big music events in Charlotte, because I covered a hip hop thing, a cat's cradle. Had no idea what I was walking into. But this has happened over and over and over and over again. Recently, I've had my heart broke. So I'm coming back and living differently. And I don't know how it will come out, but one of my sons died. And I only bring it up because he's the one I would call, and when I was doing my first painting, live painting, I was hired by Festival. I'm doing bands, and 20, I didn't realize I'd only have 20 minutes with these big canvases to do a whole band. A couple of the pieces are outside. And I thought I was going to have identity crisis. <laughs> I never felt like that for years. And I didn't know what I was going to do. All these people are watching me, and I'm like trying to do 50 of the ukulele UNC uh, musicians <laughs> on the stage trying to figure out how to put it down. And I called this son of mine, who's still with me and not with me, and he said, Mom, just do what you know how to do. Yeah. So at that point, they became more abstract. <laughs> mm -hmm. But my art is based on a lot of training. All those things I didn't understand in art school, I could teach inside out. But I'm also able to teach somebody who maybe can't see or can't hear or can't use their arms. Because I know, nobody taught me that, I have, but I know because I've done it. And I know because a lot of the people I've loved and been inspired by didn't think they could do anything, especially anything creative. And I've seen some gorgeous art. So I think I'm probably over my time. I didn't time myself. It's a couple minutes past. <laughs> I don't know when I'm supposed to end. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let me say more right now. I've got, for the first time in years, I have a sh show coming up. I am not proud of this, but I'm a Section 8 senior on the this able low income with social security I live in a tiny apartment I lost my 45 year studio when I went through the last final fusion so what did I do I said yes I'll have an exhibit 20 <laughs> pieces all right little did I know my son was going to be terminating terminal terminally ill for 20 years I mean all the year long and I need to have 20 pieces then well, I decided to make part of the retroactive show, but I also know that deep inside, it's here. And I haven't been able to share larger with paintings. And I'm gonna be doing some sculpture I'm working on now. Uh, I hope you all come. Um, it's a no, it's not any famous thing, like some people. <laughs> it's a little old lady in car world. Uh, it's going to be at the Seymour Center, the Senior Center. But for me, it's just about having the courage to share. When is your show? It's going to be May 14th. And I will be, I'm in regularly, Festival has me come in. Shakori Music Festival, I've been their event artist for about four or five years now. I'm the person that's all over the place on all the stages. 
And again, um, this time I will be doing some demonstrations and talks about my work. Um, let's see, I do wide open bluegrass, bark con, pop, scotch, uh, center fest I've been at, but I'm more like the person on the street. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody wants my art and see me drawing, you usually offer me some money and it's yours. <laughs> some people have walked off with some real famous musician drawings that way. <laughs> but you know, that's what it's about. Um, I don't expect people to understand. I can't, I don't want to be tied. I refuse, students have made, UNC students have made documentaries and videos about me. And I always say, I don't walk the path, walk my, walk the path, the, the, my speech gets affected, my past, I walk now. So I have not participated in talking about disability, not participated in at any of those, because I've wanted to just be who I am, not what I think I was or who I'm going to be. As I sat with my son, the only thing we have is now. This art I do is about now. This is all we have. And it's so beautiful. It's more than now because I'm falling back on 45, 50 years of experience. But it is still about now. And in that, I've had great peace and I experienced so much love with people. And I love it when I can draw somebody's wedding or, you know, it's, it's what the art I do is very, very personal. That's why it's had hard to advertise. I've got to figure out a way, I guess, to make it personal because everything I do is very specific about who, what, when, and it's really that moment. So that's all I got to say, except, wait a minute. <laughs> Natty, where are you? Stand up. <laughs> this lady here and I, we're in Special Olympics. Um, when you talk about swimming, the one thing I've always done is swim. When I swim, I can feel my whole body. I taught swimming, <coughs> but Maddie and I are Special Olympic coaches for swimming. <laughs> Go ahead, Maddie. But she invited me to the um, East Chapel Hill High Art Club last year and she, here I am, my son saying, I don't know what's going on. She said, will you come participate in this thing? And here I am. And I thought it was like coming to the art club and talking. <laughs> so I said, that I put her up and put her up and put her up until he, did, he died and then I had to wait till I got home. And I said yes to the very last. So that's just where I on. How I got here was I enjoyed the club and we did interactive. It's a good thing you're not closer because you would be doing something right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I had the best time and I'm so inspired by Maddie and by the group of students and the people that put this together. It totally caught me off guard. I love doing professional stuff and write, you know, I hate doing it, but I'll write a good proposal and all that. But in each thing, it's like, oh, they want slides? Oh my god. <laughs> I mean, I'm still dealing with, <laughs> but you know, this group of people were so patient and loving and they didn't even know. They didn't know. So I appeared, I'm sure, totally unprofessional. But I just want to thank you all for listening. And any time I think you give our artists a chance, you're giving them a blessing. Thank you all for coming. Um, I just, as I dismiss you, want to say thank you to the students of, Dis of Duke Disability Alliance who put this on. So that's Jay Pandy, Kevin Solomon, Maddie Fowler, Simon Ma, 
um, who did I miss? Deepthi Agnarati and um, Kathy Choi. So thank you students so much. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you. Okay.